<laughs> Bye, have a good life. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to a Monday Chit Chats. If you can tell, it is holiday Easter Monday here in France. That's why Jean is home, but he's going for a run this morning so that I can focus on filming this video. This is my least favorite weekend in France. I actually hate this weekend. <laughs> it's just, as, as an expat, as someone who is in France without her family, it's just the worst weekend for me. Just because I grew up with things like Easter Sunday and... Easter egg hunts, whether you're five years old or 20 years old, and big family dinners, and to come to France and have none of that is very hard. Like, I I really miss my family on this weekend, and we'll get into how the French celebrate Easter a little bit later, but I remember my very first Easter in Paris. It was an absolute nightmare. I had just moved to Paris, okay? So I had absolutely no friends. I had no connections here. I knew no one. And my ex-boyfriend and I had just broken up. And up until that Easter, I had spent all of the other Easters with him or his family. So I didn't feel as alone as I did on my first Easter in Paris. And I remember when I realized that it was going to be Easter weekend because it was the Friday before and I was at work, you know, chatting with the colleagues, just, you know, excited for a general weekend, but unprepared for the long weekend. And then I heard people talking about how they were going to spend their long weekend, where they were going, what they had planned. And I was just like, no, this is Easter long weekend. I have nothing planned. I'm not going to see anybody. I'm going to be all alone. <laughs> and it just like my heart sank. And I ended up spending that first Easter weekend in an unfurnished apartment, literally all by myself. Because like I said, my ex and I had just moved out of our old apartment. We had broken up. And yeah, I I just remember going for a long walk in the Bois de Boulogne on Easter Monday and just crying, like sobbing because I felt so alone. And obviously things have changed. Like I'm not alone this Easter weekend. I have Jean and, you know, it's... It's different, but I still really do miss my family on this weekend. And um, yeah, so bear with me. <laughs> it's a hard weekend, <laughs> but I hope you guys are having a good Easter Monday, a good holiday Monday, if it's a holiday where you are. And if it's not, then <laughs> just a good Monday in general. Uh, let's get to a little recap of last week. I have some interesting things to talk about. So Jean and I went to a party last week, a little French house party, and it's so different what a, f a house party means now in like my late 20s versus my early 20s and in university when house parties were like these massive things where the whole neighborhood is invited and it's drinking and drinking games and just getting up to shenanigans. And now house parties mainly consists of small groups of friends and a bottle of wine and a nice little dinner and board games. It's just so different, but it was so much fun. Jean and I, I feel like sometimes we get into a bit of a habit of spending our, sorry, when I smile, if you guys see me like do this, it's because when I smile so much and I'm genuinely so excited to be doing these podcasts, um, I cry, like I have tears that leave my eyes and I can feel them. So <laughs> Um, I'm not crying because I'm sad. Um, but yeah, sometimes John and I get into these ruts of spending our weekends in or not going out as much. And so it was really nice to have a social Friday, especially with our friends. The the two the two main people we knew at this party was Alex and David. It was actually Alex who hosted the party. And those are my friends from basketball. You've been following the basketball sagas. Um, and I hadn't seen them in quite some time just because for about six weeks, our gym had sort of been taken away from our basketball club. 
So we just didn't see each other as much. So it was really nice. It was amazing that Alex hosted this little party. And uh, I'll put a picture on the screen so you guys can get the vibes. But I did not expect this. Alex made a, or he set up a fondue. So we had this bowl, literally like this big of a bowl of cut up steak or beef. And he had an oil fondue. And so we enjoyed the fondue and fries and everybody brought little snacks for the apéro. We had beer and drinks and stuff. And yeah, it was just nice because it was a small group. We just had a good laugh catching up and talking and uh, we played code names, which was very fun as well. And the only sort of challenge, I guess, for me, and not even a challenge, but just, you know, an interesting point, I guess, is that as you guys know, I mentioned last but I'm kind of on this like weight loss journey, this health kick. And when Alex was telling everyone to bring something to add to the apéro, a drink and a snack, I knew immediately that Jean and I had to bring a huge Tupperware. I'm talking like big Tupperware of every cut vegetable under the sun. We made a really nice tuna cheese dip as well to go with it. And um, unfortunately, we forgot it. We forgot the vegetables at home so it was a little bit problematic for me because I knew whenever you go to a party and everybody like brings a little snack it's it's a given it's a given what the boys are bringing they're bringing chips or they're bringing Pringles okay and sure enough I wish I had taken a photo because I walk into the living room and on the table there's at least 15 cans of Pringles in every color and every flavor you can think of and I was like Damn, I can't believe we forgot the vegetables. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was honestly so much fun. And uh, it was nice to, to see our friends. <laughs> what else? What else? Ah, we had the time change. My favorite time of spring. I think it happened on Friday. But yeah, the clocks went forward an hour. So yesterday night, the sun was out until almost 9 p.m. It's just it was the best. It's the best feeling when the nights get longer, in my opinion. It's just, it just means that spring and summer, well, spring's already here, but summer is around the corner. Um, we also did some garage sales this weekend, and I thought that'd be a great, a great topic for me to rant about. Everybody talks so highly of Parisian garage sales and, you know, French garage sales. I see so many TikToks and, like, people suggesting and recommending that you go to a garage sale. They're called brocantes in France, but English garage sale. Or a flea market, I guess, as well, you could call it. And the thing is, brocantes are magical when you first come to Paris. And it's very fun to go through and look at all of the antiques of French culture, things that we don't have in North America. Like, it's very fascinating to go through those things. But over time, when you are living here and you're actually looking to put things in your apartment and looking to decorate and looking to buy some of these older pieces, and I don't want to call them antiques because there's just so many of them. Like everybody has, every single one of these sellers has unique, beautiful antique pieces. And uh, the thing is, people are delusional. People are delusional with their pricing. And so, yes, it's enchanting to look at. It's fun to visit as a tourist. But yeah, as someone who wants to buy things secondhand, it's so annoying because the people who are selling are not like, you know, the mom and pop sellers who are cleaning out their basement or the families that are getting rid of their children's toys and clothes and stuff. Most people who purchase a stand, because you have to buy a stand at a book called it's like 20 bucks. But most people who set up a stand at a garage sale or a flea market are professional flea marketers, okay? They travel in these vans with all of the items they're selling. And the goal for them is not just to make a little spending money, but it's to make, to make money. And it's annoying because they just sell things for ridiculous prices. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put a picture on the screen. I was looking for these glass green jars. I'm holding it like it was glass green jars. And you can buy them brand new with lid and everything for 12 euros. 
That's the price that I found them for in store and online, 12 euros. I go to a garage sale with a glass jar missing the rubber part of the lid so it's not even airtight and the metal piece was rusted and I was like oh how much are you selling this for thinking that they would sell it for like two euros and then I would go and buy the rubber piece and the metal and the lid and all that and they wanted 10 euros and I was like yeah I could buy this for for 12 euros brand new and they were like their their answer was like okay we'll go buy brand new I'm like Who was buying this for 10 euros? And then another one we saw this weekend, we were at this, this, um, yeah, we were at this Blochant and we didn't find anything that we were interested. It wasn't really what we were looking for. We're looking specifically for like, um, old fashioned candelabra things so we can stick electric, not electric, um, rechargeable light bulbs in them to use as decoration. Anyways, we overheard this woman, woman pick up a water jug okay and it was the ugliest water jug I've ever seen if you can picture I want to say maybe from the 70s or 80s the brown porcelain the brown the brown ceramic looking materials yeah it was a duck out of that very ugly very brown not something that I would put in my home and this one picked up she's like oh how much for this and he goes 20 euros, 20 euros. Okay. And then he changed his mind. He probably came to a sense of like, oh, that is a little ugly. I don't know who else is going to buy it. And then he goes, 10 euros. She's like, what? And she put it down immediately. And I was like, thank goodness you put that down. Because like, here's the thing. You could go and buy a beautiful duck water pitcher or just a nice looking water pitcher in an Ikea, in a ma, literally in any home design store for under 15 euros and so to buy something like that second ever just I, I could talk about the subject for days but um even when it came to us okay like we are looking for uh we're looking for vintage sconces vintage wall lighting and it doesn't matter to us if the electrical of that like the wiring doesn't work or anything because we won't even be able to use it we're gonna put the rechargeable light bulbs in them um, but we'd like to buy them secondhand, just, you know, for environmental reasons and for aesthetic reasons, it's better. And people want more money than they cost, like, in the stores. We bought this one light. It was a shell light. And it's like a little glass shell mounted on brass hardware, I guess. And we bought it for 60 euros. I was like, okay, well, before we unbox it, before we set it up, let's see if we can find you know, something secondhand. And we found things that are similar for a hundred euros. It's like, this is almost double what I'm paying full price in a store. So ah, our, our adventure at the garage sales this weekend did not go well. I, I don't know. I don't always remember them being like this. Like I, I, I guess again, it's the, it's, the enchantment I felt when I first came to Paris was going to these Blancons and was just so amazed. But it's like when you look at the prices and when you look at the sellers as well, like I said, it's, it's, there's just something kind of icky about people who are, I don't want to say trying to scam you, but just like really, like they're not even their items. For example, oh my God, sorry, another story time, but I bought my mom these Lambergés. Um, they're like these porcelain lamps that you put oil in and they send your home. And, you know, typically the newer ones, which are mostly made of glass, are like 40, 50 bucks. But if you try and find them secondhand on Le Bon Coin, which is like the French version of Kijiji, you can find them for like 10 bucks, okay? Um, because everybody, everybody and their mother and their grandma and their aunt owns one, owns seven of them and is trying to get rid of them. So I went to this garage sale and I found this man who was selling like 15 different lamp brochets and they were so beautiful. And I was like, this is what I'm bringing my mom home. And so I asked him for the price. He was like, oh, um, you know, 10 bucks for this one, 15 for that one. I was like, okay, that's a great deal. Like I will, I will buy four of them because that's a great deal. And then he was telling me how he got them and he had gone to an estate sale and he bought 200 of these lamps for 200 euros. So he was marking the price up by 
10 or 15 times. And I totally understand the markup because there is work involved in going out and sourcing these antique items. But um, sometimes the prices just get a little bit ridiculous. So that is my garage sale rant. <laughs> Uh, if you are interested in going to garage sales just to like look around and stuff, they they are happening every single weekend, Saturday, Sunday, in every single Ahoni Small. This weekend we went to one in the 20th, went to one in the 2nd, there was one in the 14th, there was one in Montmartre. They are just all over the place. Springtime is the time to do garage selling. And sometimes you can find good deals. I have found good deals before. Um, you do just have to sift through the... You have to sift, you, you have to go through, you have to sort out the professional garage sales or sell the, the professional garage sellers versus, you know, the family that's just there trying to make a couple bucks and actually selling their stuff for a fair price. Okay. And I think this is the last topic before I get to your questions, which are so good. I'm so excited. Um, is we tried planning our trips, our trips. We tried planning a trip this weekend because in May, um, France is known for the month of May because almost every single weekend you have one or two holidays, which makes your work week go from five days to three days or four days. And then they have what they call a pont or bridges. So if you have a holiday on a Thursday, for example, a lot of, yeah, a Thursday, a lot of people will take the Friday off and make it a four day weekend. So we were going through the ponts in May and all of the holidays that, Jean has, you know, because they're holidays and he has time off of work. And so we thought we would do, we initially thought we would do a road trip along the Côte d'Azur. We were going to rent a van uh, to save money so we don't have to buy for hotels, Airbnbs, restaurants and all that. It has a kitchen inside and a fridge and stuff. And we probably spent five hours planning this trip along the Côte d'Azur and I was so excited. I've never done the full Côte d'Azur and I've also never had a vacation in a camping car so I was just so excited and by the end of it we estimated that the price of this week-long vacation was going to be about I don't know between 2,000 and 2,500 euros which like realistically is not that much money to spend for a week-long vacation along the Côte d'Azur it would be 2,000 2,500 together so separate like a thousand a thousand two hundred each um but it's just not in the cards for us this year. It's just not in the budget this year. So we we didn't end up planning it, which is kind of sad. But it gave us some good ideas for maybe next year if we if we budget and we have the room in our budget to go on a trip. We'd really like to do that. The thing is, in April, I think as with most countries, April is tax season. And typically, I don't really worry about taxes because... The French system is much better than I want to say the Canadian system and also the American system from what I understand is that th there's no accountants, there's no doing your own accounting. The government tells you this is what you earned, this is what you should have paid because the taxes get deducted straight out of your paycheck. But if you didn't pay those taxes out of your paycheck for whatever reason, then the government will tell you, okay, you owe this much. And typically you don't owe anything because like I said, the taxes are taken out of your paycheck. But there are cases like, for example, I think one year when I got a promotion at my old job, my salary increased, but they hadn't changed the percentage of tax to be taken out of my paycheck. So by the end of the year, I owed something like 900 euros in taxes that they take out of your bank account over a three month period. And because last year I was laid off, I have no idea how that's going to affect my taxes. I don't know if I'll owe things, I don't know. So I'm like, I would rather not spend any money and that way if I have to pay anything extra in taxes, then I don't have to take out a loan to pay my taxes, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's kind of just, I, I'm excited to get get through the month of April and to finish tax season and just, not have to worry about that anymore but yeah okay that is it that is all for my topics i don't know if you guys can hear it i really hope you can't but the people above me are moving their furniture it's very loud it's very distracting you guys know me as soon as they're sound i'm like can't focus <laughs> okay questions 
So the first question is from Kate. She says, do you have any good quality natural skincare brand recommendations? Please, Kate. Kate, I'm sorry to tell you, I do not for a couple reasons. The first reason is if it's not Broxen, Broxen, if it's not broken, I don't look for ways to fix it. So generally speaking, I think my skin is all good. You know, I, I do the basics. I have one serum, I have one cream and one face wash and sunscreen. And that's what I use and I'm okay with my face and I I don't want to add products for the sake of adding products. I also think, and I think like this for a lot of things in life, like going to the gym, for example, I don't want to start buying into something that I can't maintain for the rest of my life. So for the gym, for example, I don't want to start going to the gym and lifting weights six times a week because that's not going to be sustainable for me if I become a mom, if I move to a new country, I don't know, life changes, that's not going to be sustainable. What is sustainable is my love of sports. So I do my physical exercise through sports. Same goes for skincare. I think that accessibility to products, um, longevity of products, products are changing all of the time, and cost of products are all three factors you have to consider, I think, when you're switching over to, sorry, the sun just came out, it's so bright in my eyes, when you're switching over to a skincare routine. Because if you look at the prices, there's just no way that currently or in 10 years, I can spend a hundred or hundreds of dollars on skincare. So I prefer to not even get into it if I don't feel like I need it. I also did try the natural root. So I used to make my own face cream. I think you'd be very surprised at how easy it is to make a face cream because the main ingredient is water. I mean, it's easy in terms of ingredients, but like getting the mixture and getting the the texture correct is a whole other story. So I actually used to make my own products and I actually at one point wanted to open a, open, create a 100% natural skincare line. I never got around to it because I don't really have the time or money to invest in that yet, but maybe in the future. So I think you'd be surprised at how easy it is to make your own products. I think that's something you can look into. Um, but I also did try natural makeup, natural skincare, and natural sun creams, like mineral sun creams. Scun, so not sun cream, sun, sunscreen. <laughs> and I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way it looked on my skin, especially the mineral sunscreens. I tried about mm, 12, 12, and it was just so much money trying all these different creams and none of them worked because they were either, they had either too much color in them so my face would look orange or brown, like it wouldn't match my skin complexion or it would be paper white. And no matter how much I massage it into my skin, it would just literally make me look like a sheet of paper. So I, yeah, it, for me, I, I had, I ended up choosing aesthetics over, over natural because I just, I didn't find that the, the natural skincare was like, was working for me. So I unfortunately don't have a brand to suggest to you, but I do think if natural skincare is something that you're interested in, then I definitely would take the time to research some recipes. Truly, it was when I was making my own lotions and stuff, it was very affordable and very cost effective. So that's what I would suggest. <laughs> um, Cream says, happy Easter. Thank you. Happy Easter to you too. Um, do you ever speak in French with a local in France who responds back to you in English? Woo! Sometimes, sometimes this happens. And here's the thing. If I had a thick accent or if I didn't have a good vocabulary, I would kind of understand they were trying to be helpful to me. But if I talk to a French person in French and my French is almost perfect, okay? Like I, it is the language that I have spoken for the past seven years consistently on a daily basis. So my French is very good. And so when I speak to someone in French and they assume I'm a tourist or I'm not French based on my appearance, based on who I'm with, and they just like switch into English and respond to me in English when I speak to them in French, 
I absolutely don't even acknowledge it. I continue speaking in French and I will not respond in English because I think it's rude. I don't think there's any reason why someone should switch uh, to speaking to me in English if I address them in proper French. Um, the, the times that it does happen, I will say, like it does happen when I'm by myself. Don't get me wrong. That does happen sometimes, but it's more rare than when I'm with someone like my sister or a friend and we're speaking English and then I turn to whichever French person I'm talking to and I speak to them in French. I think that that is good intention because they hear me speaking in English and they want to make things easier, make things comprehensible. So they switch to English. So that does happen. And I do understand that, but I, I always stick with the French. I just, I don't know. I, I don't know why I feel so passionately about it, but yeah, I'm in France. I speak French all the time. Like I don't, I don't feel like I need someone to, to switch in English <laughs> for me to comprehend, but it does happen. Ha most of the time I think it's well-intentioned. The other time I don't really know why when I'm by myself, they switch to English. Maybe because I look, I, I don't look French. Let's get, but I don't look French. My body type, my face, my clothes. Like when I wear leggings, when I wear leggings, people talk to me in English. <laughs> okay. Hilda says, how do Parisians celebrate Easter? Um, probably in a much different way than Hilda. I'm not too sure where you live, but definitely in a different way from the United States or from Canada. I want to say North America. In Canada, at least, like I said, my childhood was filled with family gatherings and a big Easter dinner and Easter egg hunts and my grandma bringing us these really special chocolates from the Canadian chocolatier Laura Secor. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's my memory of Easter. That's what I plan to do with my family when I have a family in the future. In France, it's definitely a lot less commercialized. You don't have Easter decorations. You don't have those plastic Easter eggs that you put chocolates in and do the Easter egg hunt. Um, people don't put as much work into the Easter egg hunts, I would say. There's no, like, communal Easter egg hunt for the children, you know? Whereas when I was a kid, we would go to Downey's Farm, and I, ha I still have memories of this, of going and seeing the animals and enjoying that day with my family, and then a big Easter egg hunt as well, like trying to find the most chocolates possible. Th that is absolutely not how Easter is celebrated in France. It's a long weekend, so people definitely spend the weekend enjoying their time. Not necessarily with family. Like, for example, Jean, I talked about going to see his parents for Easter, and he was like, I don't know, it's just not a big thing in my family. Um, it's very different from mine. Like, this weekend, my whole family was at my mom's house, my Italian side of the family. They had a huge Easter dinner, and um, that... That type of family dinner is not really how Easter is celebrated here. It's more it's more like you celebrate it where you're living, maybe with family and they if they live in the same city, and you might have a nice home-cooked dinner, but nothing extravagant or extraordinary. And again, I, I, I don't want to speak for all French people. Like, I, I'm terrified of someone coming in the comments and being like, that's not how I celebrate and I'm French. Like, I'm not speaking for all French people, but just... The reason why I feel like I have a good idea of how Easter is celebrated here is because I've studied here, I've lived here for seven years, I've, you know, had two serious boyfriends in France, so I've spent Easter with their families. Like, I think I have a good idea of how Easter is celebrated, and like I said, they celebrate it in the sense of they're enjoying the long weekend. It's not necessarily a time for huge family celebrations and like this huge holiday for the kids like you might have in Canada or North America. Um, Fatima says, hi Ariel, when is your birthday and how are you planning to celebrate? Girl, I saw this question and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> sadness, sadness. So birthdays are a huge deal for me. I have always made a huge deal of my birthday. I don't know why. I don't know why. I think it's because ever since I turned 18, I have spent my actual birthday away from family. And so I think as a protective 
defense, I'm like, I need to be surrounded by people on my birthday and I cannot feel alone. That That's always been how I've handled my birthdays. And this year, I think is the first year, sorry, my birthday's in June. Um, this year is the first year that I think I'm going to spend my birthday alone. I mean, I'm going to spend it with Jean, but I'm not going to have a huge birthday party. I'm not going to see my best friend, which is so sad because her birthday is right before mine. I'm not going to see my family. I'm actually terrified for how my birthday is going to go this year. But I don't know. The vibes have been off this year. This, the vibes have just been weird. I've really been caught up in work, caught up in this apartment and transforming it. And uh, obviously, like, I also have a very serious partner. So a lot of my time I spend with Jean. And so I haven't, I guess, put in as much time and love as I would normally into friendships. And again, like I always say, when you make friends abroad, it's just so common that people come and go and that's just how it is. So this year, I don't think I'm going to have like a big birthday party, a big friend celebration, which is a little bit scary to me. But I am happy that I get to spend it with Jean and we haven't made any plans yet. Um, we'll see what we do, but it's definitely looming over my head and I'm I'm definitely a little bit nervous about about my birthday. <laughs> um, my best birthday ever was my birthday two years ago. I had just joined, or maybe it was three years ago. Two, no, it was two years ago. I It had been one year since I joined my basketball team and I had become so close with everybody on that team. It was just like, it was insane how close we all were. And... So I invited them all to my birthday party and I had a bunch of other friends as well that I um, had made. If you remember Nikki, Prashanti. So I, I had this huge birthday party and I really wanted to go bowling. And so I dragged everybody out to like the far outskirts of Paris because that's the only place that has huge bowling alleys. And we spent the night bowling and having drinks. And then we took the videos like the bicycles, I don't know, we probably rode them for 45 minutes to the bars in Paris because we were going from the outskirts to downtown Paris and we had to go through this forest and it was just like so funny. It was the funniest birthday. It was the funnest birthday. I felt so loved on that birthday by all the people who had shown up and on top of it, the basketball team had, um, they, like my friends from the basketball team had pulled their money together and um, just got me this amazing collective gift. And I think I cried, honestly. I I just felt so loved. They ended up getting me this sweater that said um, basketball princess. I, I don't know how to translate, like a princess en basket. Like, yeah, basketball princess. And they got me a certificate to the spot. They actually asked my best friend in Canada what I would like for my birthday because they had met at another point in time. And um, she was like, Ariel has scoliosis. <laughs> she, she has a bad back. She'd love a massage. I think, I think that's how that went. Um, uh, but yeah, um, I felt so loved on that birthday, honestly. And so it won't be anything like that this year, I think, but that's okay. You know, not every year has to be over the top, but um, yeah, ah, I'm nervous. I'm definitely nervous for this year. Uh, E.B. Omhoff says, how are things on your women's basketball team? Love that you keep playing. Oh my gosh. I swear one day those girls are going to be my best friends. I only just joined this team like maybe a month and a half ago, but I think I've said before how supportive, how kind, how encouraging this group of girls is. Like I... I'm the new girl on the team. I came to them three quarters of the way through the season. They did not have to accept me on their team. And they accepted me with open arms. And I could not be more grateful. So I am still playing, obviously. I, I practice twice a week and we normally have one game a week. And 
what's so different about this team is that the coach is also amazing. The players and the coach are all amazing. And on the men's basketball team, I was absolutely neglected. The coach was not very good, not very organized. Um, and he didn't really help build your set of basketball skills. And also because I was a girl on the team, uh, I wasn't the tallest, I wasn't the strongest, I couldn't jump the highest. And I really just got like kind of pushed to the side. People, pe- I was I was wanted on the team because I have a great team spirit. Like I added that to the team. That was sort of my main selling point. And like I said, with my old basketball team, we had really built this love and friend group. But at the same time, while that was a positive part of the old basketball team, I was pushed to the side. I didn't have a role. Nobody worked with me. Nobody... Nobody valued what I could bring to a team. And I had really fallen out of love. I couldn't understand, but I had fallen out of love with basketball. Um, But when I joined this women's team, I am the tallest. I can jump the highest. And so I'm, I'm back to my love for the game that I felt before I joined the men's team. And really feeling like I'm in my element, feeling powerful, feeling strong feeling like I have something to add to this team. So it's honestly going really well. I The last practice we had last week, actually the coach and a couple girls came up to me and they were like, you have improved. In the past month and a half, you've improved so much. Because when I got to the team, I was like, I was like scared. Because the boys team, nobody passed me the ball. I wasn't allowed to have the ball. I uh, wasn't allowed to shoot. It was like, really, I was not involved at all in the, the gameplay. And so it took me a while to get back into the swing of things and like to get back to my competitive basketball edge. And last week I I did really well. And a lot of the girls, you know, told me that I had improved and like were really proud of myself. And just, I'm telling you, give it a year. These girls are going to be my best friends. I can already tell. I can already tell. <laughs> and I kind of want to link that with the next question, which is from um, KCRIE. Yelly? <laughs> Crelly? I'm sorry, you guys. If you want, when you put your questions, leave your name. That way I I, I know your name. Um, but she asks, how to make new friends in Paris? And there's only one May. One, one May? One way to make friends in Paris. And I think this goes for friendships, relationships, any type of relationship that you value, I think you build only one way. Because I've tried everything. I've tried apps. I've tried, you know, meeting people in real life. I've tried meetup groups and stuff. I've, I've really tried it all. The only way to build a solid relationship, a solid friendship, is to build that with someone where you have a point in common and you have a reason. You have something scheduled one or more times a week. The problem with things like apps or meetup groups is that people have to take time out of their schedule to see you and you don't, you don't see people consistently. So maybe you see someone once every two weeks or once every eight days and it's like this effort that you both have to put in and you have to figure out a meeting point and the problem with that is that it takes a very long time to build to build that relationship, to build that friendship, to know someone enough. And so my my solution, the way that I think, the the most effective way I think for you to to make friends in any new place, Paris, wherever, is to join a sports team, join a club, volunteer. You need to be involved in something. Literally, it could be anything where you are, you have it in your calendar, and you go to that activity, you go to that club, you go to that event at least once a week. And you see the same people minimum once a week. And over time, you you systematically and automatically build friendships and relationships with these people. Like this hasn't only been the case for me in basketball. I mean, basketball is where I met my friend group and my boyfriend, okay? Like that is a testament to the effectiveness of team sports. But I also do boxing. And I've been boxing at this new club for about three months now. And I go twice a week. 
And I see the same people twice a week. And it's not just the fact that you're seeing these people. It's that you're working together. So basketball, it's a team sport. You, you're you learning everyone's names. You're learning everyone's habits. You're passing the ball and you're working together for a common goal. You're building confidence in each other. You're, it's a common goal. Boxing, we're sparring against each other. You're laughing. You're, you know, helping each other with technique. You're, you're physically close to each other. And just over time, activities like that build, build the relationships. And again, because it's something that you paid for or you signed up for, and it is an event that reoccurs every single week, it's already in everybody's calendar. There's no need to work around everybody's schedule, see if they can make it, if they can come here, if they can take the metro here, if they want to go for dinner, whatever. It's it's paid for, it's booked in everybody's calendar, and it's just such a way, an easy way to, to build connections with people. The only other way that I would say this would work, aside from joining a club, a sport, a hobby, whatever, is to have roommates. Because again, roommates, you see on a daily basis, systematically, you know, and this can go good or bad. Like you can have good roommates that you get along with, or you can have bad roommates that you really don't get along with. But again, it's a strategy for for doing something in life where you see the same people over and over. And like the reason I feel so confidently about this is because I really have tried Facebook meetup groups. I've tried Bumble and all of the girls that I've met off of Bumble or Facebook. It's not that they haven't been nice girls or anything like that. It's just the, the ultimate end to those friendships and the problems with those friendships is that it gets to a point where your lives maybe are so chaotic or you have so much going on that you don't see each other enough to build a connection and that's just sort of the friendship kind of crumbles um so yeah that's my tip that is my number one tip and there's so many ways, like there's so many things you can join. Um, if you're in Paris right now, look at the, it's called the Mairie, the city hall of your arrondissement. They often offer very affordable classes or courses. A couple of my friends do dance classes, others do sewing classes, cooking classes, and they're very affordable. And it's just a really great way to meet French people, to meet international people. To meet people as well who have a common interest with you. All right, that's enough. I need to stop. Can you tell I feel passionate about that? Okay, last question. Zoe Zoe says, do an art guide. Oh, man, I would love to, but I don't feel confident in my art knowledge. History of Paris, Paris activities, 100%. You you asked me a question, I could I could talk to you for hours about the history, the architecture, all that of Paris. But art is just not a topic that I master. It's never been something that I've studied or learned enough about. Maybe in the future, but I just don't feel like I have enough knowledge about art to make a guide. But I'll consider it. I will consider it because I am trying to figure out guides that aren't targeted specifically to people who want an itinerary. Um, right now I am building three tiers of itinerary. So I have beginner, first timers, um, you know, second or third time in Paris and then expert level. You want to experience Paris like a local. So I'm going to have three categories of itineraries, but then I also do want to have itineraries for people who like me, who live here and who just want to discover new events or new restaurants and maybe art could be one of those itineraries as well. So thank you for that suggestion. If you guys have other itinerary suggestions, uh, please do let me know because again, I want them to be accessible and something that people can enjoy, whether it's their first time or their hundredth time in Paris. But yeah, thank you Zoe for that suggestion. And with that, this Easter Monday podcast comes to a close and also this Easter long weekend. <laughs> I can't lie. I can't lie. I'm excited. I Maybe I'll call my mom, actually. Maybe I'll call my mom and get the tea on how <laughs> the family party went. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this week's podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. 
And I look forward. If you guys have time, please leave me some comments down below. It's I, I was thinking about it this morning, how like I was going through in my head what I wanted to talk to you guys about. And I, it just like, I say this all the time. It's like a broken record, but I get so excited to make these podcasts. I love, um, I love connecting with you guys on a more personal and intimate level. But uh, yeah, all right, that's it. That's it. I'm hungry. I want to go make lunch. <laughs> I will see you guys in my next one, probably ooh, probably on Saturday, and it's a good one. It's a good one. Make sure you tune in Saturday. I think I think you'll enjoy. <laughs> okay, that's it. Bye.